welcome to uh, Monday. So Monday is solved or unsolved and a start of a new week on Unsolved No More. Uh, this week we're going to be looking at the quote unquote yogurt shop murders. Um, I chose this one because I have a lot of elements I feel that we can use. It's a convoluted case in a way, but I think I want to break it down and make it a lot simpler than what it is. Uh, I heard about this case before and it's been requested a lot, but I remember watching this. I believe it was on Unsolved Mysteries a long time ago and I have a pretty good uh, memory at least up until recently with, <laughs> with age I guess. Um, but I still recall certain things and certain things stick with me and this is one of them. So for you that are not familiar, this happened in Austin, Texas on December 6, 1991, and it's a quadruple murder. Um, it was inside a, uh, a business called uh, oh, something yogurt. I can't remember the name of the actual business, but they were it was a yogurt shop. And four people, as I mentioned, were murdered. Um, I got it written down here. The two workers were Jennifer Harbison, who was 17, Aliza Thomas, who was 17. They were working that night, and they were getting ready to close. They got accompanied that night by Sarah Harbison, who was 15, who was Jennifer's sister, who was working, and her friend Amy Ayers, who was 13. Those two had come. They had been shopping. This business was located in a strip mall. It's very important. Uh, the location of the of the business it's going to tell us something and lead us to uh, a probable offender along with a lot of other things but basically what happened was um, they were a fire broke out in that business a patrol officer was nearby he saw it and the fire department got on scene and they discovered the four bodies in the back they were nude they had been shot in the head apparently execution style I want to get into that a little bit more uh, later when I look into this because the manner of death how they were shot uh, is all important when you're trying to uh, use a crime scene assessment and determine what type of individual committed this crime Now, in this case, there isn't a lot of evidence. But the crime scene will tell you a lot. They were apparently bound and gagged. And now, I will research this further. As you guys know that have been with me for a while, Monday's Solved or Unsolved is basically a, a generic overview of the case. I'm still in the midst of doing my research. I've researched this for a couple of days, read some appeals of, of trial transcripts and, and such, looked at a couple crime scene photos that I could get my hands on, and I haven't dug down deep into this. And what I mean by that is when I say they were bound and gagged, okay, well, I need to know with what, I need to know how, I need to know if knots were used, um, meticulous findings like that is very important it's not good enough just to know they were bound it's not just good enough to know they were gagged I got to know with what were items brought into the shop or is it used with items from the shop in this case I have read that it was with their own clothing but as always the source of where you get this information from an example the first thing I've written down in my notes is lighter fluid question mark because one of the initial reports that I had read had said they were doused with lighter fluid and set on fire. That's the very first thing I've written down here because that tells you a lot. Who, who has lighter fluid, you know, on hand? 
Well, number one, okay, well, maybe it's somebody that is a camper, that camps a lot, is an outdoorsman. Or it shows premeditation. Hey, they were coming here to set a fire. But the more I read, there's no indication that light of fluid was ever used. So, again, you have to be very, very careful of the information you get and where you get it from. This is That's a prime example of that. Um... DNA in this case is going to play a role again it appears that two people were raped now I want to know and DNA was recovered years later I, I got to get the factual information from that and the source were they raped and which ones were raped that's important as well there was an arrest in this case. There was a confession in this case. This case reminds me a lot on the onset of the West Memphis Three, in a way. I read the confessions uh, very meticulously today. That, I'll leave it at that. Again, there was an arrest. There was a, a conviction of two out of the four suspects, them being uh, Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen. They went on trial. Two other people, Maurice Pierce and Forrest Wellborn, were never brought to trial. Um, but the two that went to trial were found guilty, but they got out on appeals. And again, that doesn't mean they're innocent. They weren't released because of exculpatory evidence. They were released on legal appeals. It's important to look at all of this, okay? As the week goes on, especially Wednesday, I'll get into the confession part of it, for sure. We'll dissect that. The DNA, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys a lot about DNA that you may not know, or that you may know. Just because you have DNA, or, or you read somewhere that there's DNA available, doesn't, you know, think of the John JonBenet Ramsey case. Everyone gets hung up that, well, DNA was found in John Bonet's underwear, but it wasn't linked to anybody, the family or anybody else. So therefore the family didn't do it. That's not true. If you believe that, then you're just being ignorant to DNA. As I discussed before, there is case study, experimental studies done, where you can extract DNA from a brand new pair of underwear and you can trace it back to the factory workers that is the I hate to say problem with DNA but it is a problem everyone thinks DNA is this great um, crime-solving you know luxury that police have and it is but technology has advanced so much that it is picking up DNA that isn't even relevant to the crime. Therefore, it throws certain reasonable doubt into the prosecution if they ever arrest anybody. Is that the case here? I don't know. Because I have to do some more digging because I don't know where this DNA come from and that's bothering me. There's YSTR DNA in this case. YSTR DNA is through the male side of the genes therefore it's not all inclusive you could get a match from a YSTR crime scene and it could match a couple thousand people or more than that it's a start it, it certainly helps and I think you can certainly you can eliminate but I need to know okay where this YSTR is coming from 
It's much like the Sherry Joe Bates murder that from the Zodiac case. You know, at one point in time, um, we had our own lab when I was uh, running ASOC. And I had set up a DNA lab with Susanna Ryan, and she's the one who did our DNA. And the DNA we got off of the, the offender's watch and also the victim's pants had YSTR DNA. Sorry about that. I need that Pete's coffee in the morning. Pete's, come on, man. You got to sponsor me as much as I'm eating or drinking your coffee. Sometimes it feels like I'm eating it because it's, it's pretty thick and heavy. But I love my dark roast coffee. Anyway, I digress. Um, so YSTR, I need to know what it is. If the victims were raped, I need to know whether that DNA is semen. I need to know whether it's blood. I need to know whether it's touch. Oh, that's very important. Where was that DNA found? That's paramount. Was it found on the bindings? Was it found in a rape kit? How badly were these bodies burned? You have to remember, uh, they were shot, presumably raped. I haven't seen any evidence of that yet. set on fire and then the fire company comes in with the water and that destroys a lot of evidence but you know those fire hoses are so powerful it could even move the positioning of the bodies if you think about it so again it's a very convoluted case but I think this case for me is going to come down to criminal profiling and I think that's what I'm going to do for this case I will get into the DNA into the confessions I will not get into too much of the legal aspects of it but I think there's enough there in order to do a a good criminal profile of this person or persons who committed this crime uh, I think I'll use crime scene assessment pictures, all those things in order to come up with a good profile, good crime scene assessment of who would have more than likely committed this crime. And if it matches the people that were arrested, then eventually let go. This is a big case, especially in Texas. And the reason I say it reminds me of West Memphis 3 is because the confession, you know, people say, why, why would somebody confess to something they didn't do? Listen, we can second guess things all we want until you're in that situation. And even if you are in that situation, you say to yourself, you would never confess to something you didn't do, but it happens. And just because you wouldn't do something doesn't mean somebody else wouldn't do something. Everybody reacts differently to a different situation. Think of last week and the Darley Routier case, or two weeks ago, um, in the Silly String video. Everybody gets so bent out of shape about that. But you don't know, you know, she reacts differently to grief than other people, or whatever it is. So I don't go off of that. You go off of facts, you go off of the DNA, you go off of the location of the bodies, where the bodies moved, um, the bindings, eyewitness statements, you know, all that stuff obviously is crucial in determining, you know, who the offender or offenders are. I'm fairly confident in this. I think there's enough there that I'm able to do a, a good criminal profile on this. I haven't done a criminal profile in a while and <clears throat> the reason being is it's just a tool criminal profiling is nothing more than a tool I read one on the Martha Moxley case that the FBI did and one uh, and and uh, there's no bigger um, fan of FBI criminal profiling than me I mean I worked with Jim Clemente uh, Mark Safarik, um, 
you know, shared some emails with John Douglas. Read, you know, obviously all of John Douglas's books when I was younger. Um, Bob Ressler and Mary Ellen O'Toole. I mean, you know, I'm fairly decent friends with her, and we worked together on Hunt for the Zodiac case and coming up with a profile for the Zodiac killer. So I, I'm a big fan of theirs. Even uh, Richard Walters from the VDOC Society, I mean, he's the one that kind of got me started in all of this. And when I went to his house, oh, probably 10 years ago, you know, we went through his methodology, which is different than the FBI's for criminal profiling, but I still learned from it. And he was very gracious, and uh, I respect him very much. So... I was able to take that, and then, of course, I went for my master's degree, and I was studying criminal profiling uh, there, but again, it's a tool. It's It won't solve your case for you, and I think the FBI will tell you that, but I get back to the Martha Moxley case where they had stated uh, that the person that committed that crime... Was in, I think it said that it was, they were intoxicated. Or they didn't have a job. Might have been both. And I can't get behind that. Because I don't know where that's coming from. I don't, I don't know how you can determine that. To me, that goes a little bit too far in your criminal profiling. I don't think there's anything done at that crime scene, I'm speaking of Martha Moxley, that you could deduce that the person doesn't have a job. Possibly you'd be able to deduce that they were intoxicated, but I still don't see that. Um, so to me, that pushes it a little bit too far. Now, if they can explain to me how they come up with that, I certainly am all ears, but when I do it, I'll explain w well why. If I say the person that committed this Austin yogurt shop murder is a white male juvenile, you can't just arbitrarily say that and then move on and give the rest of your assessment. Why? That's what's important. Too many people just throw out arbitrary things when they do criminal profiling. Some of them aren't even... They're not qualified to do that. Um, so, if I say that it's a white male juvenile, well, I have to tell you why. I can say, well, it's based on the geographic population of that area. There is no black males in the area. And it's a juvenile because of the time of night. Now, I'm just making this up, but I'm just illustrating <clears throat> how you have to back your criminal profile up by facts. So, I, I think I will be able to do that in this case, and it will help, I believe, point towards the offender. Um, what else do I want to look at? The crime scene, I said the crime scene assessment, looking at the photographs that you can find. Victimology, obviously, is going to be paramount. We have to look into all four girls and find out, hey, was there any, any enemies? You know, to me, this case, really, right off the bat, I know it's convoluted, and I said that. But right off the bat, after looking at it for a day, it's simple. Sometimes you don't have to go down all those rabbit holes and get caught up in certain things. Focus on the evidence, what's there, the victimology, the suspect knowledge, the means, the motive, the opportunity, um, the crime scene and assessment, the DNA, the evidence. That's where my focus is. Don't broaden it and don't start going down rabbit holes. Stick with the simple explanation, what happened, this is what happened. This is more than likely who's responsible and move on. So this week, that's what I hope to do for you. 
So solved or unsolved, this is certainly unsolved, um, without a doubt. And by the end of the week, I'll let you know what I think. Tomorrow, I'm going to do my key clue. Now remember, that key clue is something that I was reading, something I saw that immediately was like, ooh, that's important. Okay, I'm going to give you that Tuesday. Wednesday will be the deep dive. And we'll get into all this. You know, everybody loves the deep dive. And we work up to that. And then Thursday, we'll do the live chat. And Friday, I'll answer your questions and your comments. And we'll move on to another case. So that's going to be it for, uh, for today. Solved or unsolved, the yogurt shop murders, definitely unsolved. So I'll see you Tuesday. And uh, we'll go there for Ken's Key Clue. Okay. So this week we're looking at the yogurt shop murders and I wanted to do a little bit of a bonus video for this week. This week I'm going to throw in a video uh, about criminal profiling, crime scene assessment. If there was ever a case that I saw that was rife for a uh, criminal profile, I believe it's this one. And that's why I want some cases you don't get that. Uh, missing person cases when you don't have a crime scene uh, it's very hard to deduce anything or take anything from that but here I think there is a lot that's given that I'm able to look at it and tell you what I think uh, you know I hate to say criminal profiling all the time because uh, to me, again, it's always more about crime scene assessment. And what I mean by that is looking at the crime scene and deducing things from that. For example, I'll get into that. So for these yogurt shop murders, quadruple homicide, four individuals, females, two age 17, one 15, one 13. Um, the 15-year-old and one of the 17-year-olds were sisters. The two 17-year-olds were working that night, and the 15- and 13-year-olds kind of happened upon them. They were planning a, a sleepover with them, and they were coming to the shop to help them clean up so they could get out on time. That's going to be important. But from the crime scene, this is what I can deduce. Um, number one, and I want to preface this by saying this is just my opinion based on my experience in my uh, my education now I think the FBI did a criminal profile on this if I'm not mistaken and I think in one of the newspaper reports that I read um, they had said that I don't know if mine will agree or disagree with them but I'm gonna tell you what I think Number one, there was at least two of them for sure. And I'm going to stick with there was two. The reason that I say that, obviously, is because there were two weapons used. A 22 revolver was used to kill or to shoot all four victims. But then a 380 was introduced and shot Amy Ayers, the 13-year-old, as well as the 22 therefore most offenders are not carrying two guns however as everything that's not foolproof could have two guns one could have jammed could have ran out of bullets and resorted to a 380 that's highly unlikely in my opinion hence my assertion that there was two or more offenders but I'm gonna say two um, and the reason I say two is the the area of where these bodies were found very small in addition uh, there was two individuals seen in the yogurt shop at closing time when this happened and I think more than likely that they are probably the offenders but um, two possibly three offenders they were experienced offenders age frame is going to be uh, an age frame is always hard I hate people that just arbitrarily throw out ages and they don't back that up but I will say they were over 20 uh, for sure 
and that's about as far as I could deduce and the reason I say that is because I believe that these offenders had done had done a stint in prison could have been local jail but I tend to believe it was state time and I'll get into more as to why I believe that but um, With them not bringing, the, the individuals, the victims, were bound and gagged, okay? To me, that shows an experienced offender. The whole totality of everything tells me that these offenders were in some sort of correctional facility. And to go even further than that, I will state that I believe believe that they were placed in a correctional facility due to an eyewitness testimony. Now, how do you back that up, Kenny? Well, this is how I back that up. If you, if your intent is to burglarize or rob a business, why kill the individuals? There's only two reasons. One is because they know you or one of them knows you, at least one of them knows you, or two, because you're not going to let the mistake happen again. Does that make sense? So, in my thought process, it's more as if, okay, we burglarized this business, we got the money, now it's, it's witness elimination. I have to get rid of these witnesses because remember the last time we were, or at least one of them, was identified through an eyewitness at a trial or whatever it was, and I'm not taking that chance again. That's what I believe. I believe that it, it was not planned in a sense. I believe that it could have been hastily cased. And by that I mean, it appears that all the other businesses closed earlier than the yogurt shop did that night or on routine basis. So this was a Friday and I always say that that's very important because Friday is a good indicator of uh, the party weekend. It's starting. You know, when a crime happens on a Wednesday or Thursday, um, that is different to me than when it happens on a Friday or Saturday. So, in this case, I believe that it could possibly have been somebody out looking uh, for money for uh, drugs or to party with. I believe that. When I say that the place had been cased hastily, I mean it wasn't, it didn't go down as planned. And I'll explain it to you as this. Their own clothing were used to bind them. If you are, if you plan extensively for a case like this, you would bring your own bindings. Because how do you know what bindings are in there? Unless you've done it before. Okay? So, to me, the offenders, it's either one or two. They had, they had uh, tied up people in burglaries or robberies before with their own clothing or more than likely they were not expecting the two people in the back so what do I mean by that you have two people working they're casing the place out they know that two people are working okay now the sister and the sister's friend shows up and they're in the back doing dishes and this is according to several witnesses they didn't see him out front but we know they were there so to me, that possibly could mean, okay, your two or three offenders are planning this. They see two people in there. Then all of a sudden, when it happens, when it goes down, they're surprised to see there's four people there. Now, the, the element of control is kind of unbalanced. You can control two people, obviously, a lot more than four people. So then you use the clothing as bindings as like almost like a weapon of opportunity 
So it's one of the two. I tend to believe that they were experienced, but this caught them off guard. Um, I, I tend to believe that the offenders had burglarized businesses in the past where it was almost closing time. Uh, I believe that. I have that written down. I don't think that they killed before, but they may have. That, that's a tough one to decide. And the reason I talk about this is that they were shot execution style. Uh, looks like in the back of the head when they were laying down. Again, it's possible that they had done that before. What I do know, I think for sure, is that at least one of them had experience with arson. You set the place on fire, like I said, because you want to destroy evidence, and it's why you kill the people. No witnesses. That's a, to me, that's a learned mentality. You learn that. You learn that in a correctional facility. You learn that through past successes or past mistakes, one or the other. I have some more notes written down here on the criminal profile. <sighs> Sexual assault. Okay. I have to get into this because originally when I looked at this, I... I saw that there was no sexual assault that occurred. So that then the further I researched, I saw that, yes, two of the girls were raped. That throws a whole new dynamic into a criminal profile or a crime scene assessment. Now you, you, you got to, okay, why? What's this about? To me, I still believe that this homicides were... A burglary a robbery stripping them to use their bindings to control them because they were caught off guard by the being four of them the rape of two of them I believe was a secondary motive it wasn't planned it was more evolved they had they were comfortable in that shop the front door was locked the back doors there like I said, they had cased that at least that night. Could have been a night prior, but some sort of hasty case of that place took place. They probably parked their car out back, and that's where the egress was. Now, why does the rape occur? There are many cases that either a robbery happens, that's the intent, and a rape and a murder occur secondary to that and vice versa obviously it's one or the other for this case and I believe it's it's the secondary the rape occurred and it occurred because the girls stripped down because the offenders used their bindings and it was an opportunity and they felt comfortable in that back room now, I've not seen photos of the back of that yogurt shop, but I'm guessing it had no windows. And that's why everything happened in the back there. And I'll get more into this, into the deep dive. I'll get into the timeline, what I think happened. But uh, this criminal profile and crime scene assessment stood out to me. And I wanted to get that out to you because I think it's important. It's important when you look at the totality of everything in order to try to deduce who's responsible for this. And it's not a lot, but that's because I don't like to say anything that I'm, I'm not sure about. Like, I, I can't say race, white or black. I, I don't know that. Now, if you went off of statistics, which criminal profiling does a lot, you look at the population then maybe you're able to say, okay, it could be a white male or a black male, but I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to do that because I can't tell that from the crime scene. A crime scene assessment is what does the crime scene tell you? That's it. It doesn't tell me whether the offender is white or black. 
It doesn't tell me the age other than I believe he was old enough to have been incarcerated into a facility at one time. Could have been a juvenile facility, which places the offender from age 20 and up. Um, you could go as far as saying 20 to, let's say, uh, 50. And the reason you would stop at 50 is because the bodies were stacked, so that took some sort of strength in order to do that. But if there's two of them, well, then you have help. So you can't limit it to age 20 to 50. And that's how I do my crime scene assessments and crime scene profiles. So hopefully uh, you learn something from this or you maybe see things through my eyes. And we'll get through this the whole week of this yogurt shop murders. And you'll see uh, what I see when I put it all together on Wednesday's deep dive. That's it for uh, this Ken's crime scene assessment. It could be a new thing that we start for the week. Maybe I'll throw that in on Tuesdays along with Ken's key clue. We'll have two videos on Tuesdays if the crime scene warrants it. Okay, for that, you know what this is, what's next as always. Hey, Maine's out. Okay, it's Tuesday. Ken's key clue to the yogurt shop murders. I spent a lot of time on this case researching as much as I could um, the crime scene is going to tell you a lot in this case and I think that's what it comes down to you have to look at the crime scene you have to look at the positioning of the victims bodies uh, you have to look at the shop in general the layout of it eventually that's going to tell you who more than likely committed this maybe not by name and a lot of times you can't do that but you can deduce it just like a criminal profile does whether it's a juvenile whether it's an elderly person what their financial situations and all, all that will play into it I'm certainly going to get into that the evidence in this case is not a lot but a lot if that makes sense meaning there isn't a lot but what's there tells you a lot and it tells me a lot there was some contradicting evidence that you have to weed through and go back to original sources in order to get get the facts and in this case I used uh, some trial transcripts again and I linked that in the uh, in the first unsolved or unsolved session that came out Monday but I'll link it again in this video so you can read it for yourself but what what was the key piece of evidence in this case that pointed me in a certain direction and it took a little bit I'm not gonna lie to you but it was the bindings The girls, at least three of them, were bound. Now that tells you something. It tells me something. But how they were bound and what with. That in conjunction with a confession that was given when one of the suspects was asked that same question, what were they bound with? Um... That is the key clue to me. They were bound by their own clothing. Now why is that significant, you might be asking. Well, it's very significant. And I'll tell you why. I was going to wait until Wednesday to tell you. Uh, I'll get in more in into it Wednesday. But to me... Um, You could say it rules out premeditation, right? Because if someone intended to do this, they would bring their own bindings. Think of Ted Bundy uh, and you know, murder kit. You know, you have certain things in there that you will use. But that isn't always the case. In, in this instant, to me, 
my opinion, based off of my training and my experience with cool cases, I would say that the reason they use their own clothing as bindings is because the offender had done it before. And I'll get into why I believe that uh, tomorrow on the deep dive. Three of the four girls being bound. I'll get into why the fourth girl was or was not bound uh, tomorrow. And I'll get into a whole criminal profiling aspect of this and how how I or any well I can't say any criminal profiler because everybody does things different but how I look at the scene and start deducing certain things like the bindings like the killings you know you why why if this is a burglary why do you kill there's two reasons for that, and I'll get into that. And off of that, you can deduce who more than likely the possible suspect is. Uh, stuff like um, if it's if it was a planned rape, then why is money missing? All of that. It seems complicated and convoluted, but it's really not. You just start deducing. You start taking away. Okay, well, this is a fact. And because that's a fact, we can remove this from the equation. And we'll filter it down to more than likely who I think is responsible for these brutal, brutal homicides. Hey, I don't want to keep going. This is That's Ken's key clue. Heck, we're only 5 minutes and 37 seconds in here. But... There's no reason to keep harping on, on it when it's already, I said and done. The key clues the bindings. And I'll tell you more about it and why it is come Wednesday. So, that's it. That's your little five-minute section for Ken's Key Clue. It's short, concise, short and sweet, just like me. Main's out. Hey, welcome to Wednesday's Deep Dive on the Yogurt Shop Murders. Wow. What a uh, what an intense week it really was of studying this case. Uh, a lot to it. it seemed like just when uh, you know you start to figure things out or have an understanding is a better way of putting it, having a grasp on the case. Because let's be honest, there's investigators that probably spent decades on this case, and here I am coming in and spending three or four days uh, researching it. By no means do I have a grasp on the case like they do. But this one had a lot of twists and turns to it. Every time I dug deeper, I found something that would change the course of my assessment completely. Such as it looking just like a strict robbery. Then all of a sudden, the more you research it, okay, now there's a sexual component to it. Then there was, okay, there's DNA, but where did that DNA come from? You can't find it, can't find it. It just says DNA from one of the bodies. Was it touched DNA? Unlikely because of a fire, but possibly where did they find it? There was no sexual assault. And then all of a sudden you find out, well, okay, it's from a vaginal smear from one of the victims. Okay, well now you got rape potentially tied into it unless it's from a boyfriend, and we'll get into all that going forward. Uh, so... What a case. Just, I'm going to have to get a drink of water for this. Okay. So for those who didn't watch uh, Monday or Tuesday's video, I'll do a brief recap of December 6, 1991, a quadruple homicide of four individuals at the, I can't believe it's not yogurt, strip mall section of the business. Two of them were workers. Two 17-year-old girls, and i get their names for you. Jennifer Harbison and Eliza Thomas, both 17. They were working that night. They were accompanied by two other individuals. Jennifer's sister, Sarah, who was 15, and then Sarah's friend, Amy, who was 13. 
They w- did not work there. They had been out shopping earlier in the in the mall, and they had came there to help them close up the business. It was Friday night, and from what I understand, there was going to be a sleepover of some sort. So they were trying to get them out of there early. The yogurt shop closed at 11 o'clock, which was atypical for most businesses around there. They had closed earlier. That's going to be important, and I'm sure that if you watch the criminal profile crime scene assessment that I had given, you know why that that is important. So let's let's start with the victimology like we always do. Uh, four teenage girls, two of them are 17, one's 15, one's 13. All high school girls, nothing that I read in their background would make them at all a high-risk victim. No domestic disturbances, no uh, jealous boyfriends, nothing of the sort. Just hard-working girls, uh, kids, basically. And what you can learn from their victimology is that more than likely, I think, when confronted, they would comply. Okay? Although, you don't know for sure. Again, you don't know what anybody will do in any given circumstance. So, it's... But you can... You can Try to understand that a little bit from their victimology. And that will play into this whole assessment as well. Now, timeline. Let's start this timeline around 9.30 at night. 9.30 at night, there's a ex-military police officer who runs a security security business that stops into the yogurt shop he is troubled or he notices a young man in his early 20s in uh, like an army fatigue jacket kind of like Rambo in first blood that type of jacket I'm assuming the way it's described that's how I see it the guy was kind of ushering people in front of him uh, go ahead and go in front of me. Maybe as if he didn't know what he was going to purchase yet or other means. He asked this military, ex-military police officer if he was a cop. Now immediately that struck me, but the more I researched, I found out that the reason that that occurred is because of the type of vehicle that the guy was driving. So... That that plays into it. Um, the guy asks to use the bathroom. He orders a soda, which I found a little bit odd. Uses this, the bathroom, and the guy leaves. The, the ex-military police officer leaves and never sees him. But when he's interviewed later, he gives that account. We're going to step forward to 1042. The girls... Are, are already cleaning up. They're getting ready to get out of there. They had went, two of them had gone, or maybe one of them, I think maybe it was Jennifer, what, but it doesn't matter who went. Somebody went and got a pizza and they had brought it back and they were eating the pizza, cleaning up. The reason you know that they were cleaning up, one is the photographs later showing chairs being placed on top so the place could be mopped. Also, witnesses were still coming in, getting yogurt and getting things before it closed. But the girls were cleaning up. <clears throat> Sarah and Amy had stopped in, like I said, to help them. Some witnesses didn't see them. And that's because they were in the back doing the dishes and doing whatever needed to be done back there. The pizza box was also found back there. So we can assume that they were back there. This is going to be key. Um... But at, so at 1042, the last sale was done, according to the register. That was from a couple that had come in, and they had bought yogurt. I think they had just gone to the movies or something. But they observed two individuals in the yogurt shop sitting at a booth. Now, you look at my thumbnail of Ken's Key Clue, 
and you'll see the picture. Very, very, very telling. You see the chairs stacked up on all of the tables except for that one. You see the napkin holder as well. All the napkin holders, and anyone that's ever worked in a restaurant know you replace those uh, if they need them. This one didn't have it. So it is assumed that the two individuals that the couple sees at 1042 is sitting at that table. They're described uh, one smaller, one bigger, I believe uh, in their 20s as well. That's at 1042. At 11.03, now this is three minutes after the store is supposed to be closed, a no sale is rung up on a register. Now what does that mean? Well, that means that somebody hit a button on the no sale and it could possibly be to take the cash out or could have been the offenders. It's important that those two individuals have never been identified, right? This is at 11.03. At 11.47, the fire is reported. There's smoke coming up. Um, people see it, start calling. Police officers show up on the scene. So that is a, a about a 45-minute window. And if we assume that the two people that were sitting in that booth are more than likely offenders, and I believe that they are, uh, they had approximately an hour in that business to do whatever they were they were doing um, that tells you a lot you know and you, that you've seen the criminal profiling video that I did crime scene assessment so I will get into that a little bit more here of the crime scene assessment but that I wanted to go through the timeline okay firefighters come they douse the building. One of the firefighters, they're actually stepping on the bodies and they don't realize it. One of them looks down and sees a foot, taps his fellow firefighter and says, hey, is that what I think it is, blah, blah, blah. Back up, okay. So now they start looking. The way the crime scene is, it's contained to the back, okay. The offender or offenders had stripped these girls naked used their own bindings to tie their hands behind their back. Some were gagged. One of the girls was actually strangled, but not to death. More than likely that was done to comply. Uh, and the place was set on fire. And they were all stacked on top of each other after they were shot in the head. Presumably execution style. So that means all four were laid down and then shot. Then they were stacked on each other. Why do you do that? Okay, that's something that I had to come up with. Why? If you lay all four individuals down, they're naked, they're bound, they're gag. First of all, why don't you just leave? Why don't you just, you got the money. They're tied up, they're controlled, leave. But the offenders don't do this. Instead, they execute them. In addition, they stack them on top of each other. Then, place items on their bodies and then light it on fire and then leave out the back door. Now, why do you do that? Why, is it, why as an offender, do you do that? Why not just leave? It's my opinion is because you've been caught before. You know not to leave a witness because it has gotten you in trouble and more than likely put you in a correctional facility before. So you leave no witnesses. That's my opinion. Now let's talk about the bindings. Why bind them? And what does that tell you? It tells me that this crime was not planned. If it's planned, you bring your own bindings. Or, I believe, 
the place was being cased. At least, okay, let's say an hour before the fire. Let's say it was these two individuals in there. I find it hard to believe they wouldn't know that there's four individuals in there, even though two of them were in the back. But let's say that they don't. They have every intention of just robbing this place, and they have cased it out earlier in the night, and they see two people working. Maybe they had cased it out a day before, and there's only two people working there. And all of a sudden, they're confronted with four people. Four people is a lot harder to control than two people. So now what do you got to do? Well, you're not prepared for this, so you strip them. That controls them. Also, you use their clothing, their underwear, their bra as bindings. That is not something that I believe a juvenile offender will do. Why do you ask that? Or why do you say that? You can't just arbitrarily say that. Well, I say that because, to me, that is more of an experienced person who has done that before. So it's planned, but not. it didn't go as planned. Does that make sense? Because they're surprised that there's four people in there instead of two. And that's backed up by witnesses who said, hey, we were in the shop. We didn't see four people. We saw two. Well, that's because two in the back were doing whatever they were doing, dishes or, or whatnot. Uh, the... As I said earlier, it was it's difficult because the more you get into it, the more you find out. So at first I thought that this was a simple robbery. But then I come to find out that no, two of the people, victims, were raped, were sexually assaulted. And, in fact, DNA was recovered from two of those. Well, that changes the course of, of everything. Now you got to look at, okay, was was the reason for this a sexual assault to begin with? And are you covering up that? Or is it robbery and then a rape secondary to that? I'm sorry that I am keep drinking water, but my mouth's getting dry the more I talk. In addition, we find out that I originally saw that lighter fluid was used as an accelerant. But the more I looked, there, there was no evidence of any accelerant being used. But it's portrayed that that's fact. And that bothered me. Because that changes the course of anything. If it's for sure an accelerant was used, such as lighter fluid, th then obviously you're looking at a planned crime to bring... A lighter fluid to that or the person's a camper barbecue or something and that narrows your suspect pool but there's no indication that an accelerant was even used uh, so the crime happens four people dead two of them raped bound and gagged place set ablaze At some point, an individual named Maurice Pierce was arrested with a 22 caliber, I believe it was revolver, from the mall. Now, the mall, I guess, is in close proximity to the pizza place because, in fact, the two girls, Amy and Sarah, had been to the mall earlier before this crime occurred. Maurice is brought in, <clears throat> question, guns confiscated, and it does not match the, the slugs that were found inside a body. <clears throat> you got to understand now, a 22 caliber revolver, or a 22 caliber in general, a lot of times, it's not, it's not a powerful weapon. It will certainly kill you, uh, but a lot of times the bullet itself will be found inside the body because it doesn't have enough oomph. To get through so in this case it was found now Amy you get, the way the bodies were found they were stacked on top of each other Amy had somehow 
her body was found a little bit, a few feet away in the same room, but not stacked. The other girl looked like she had rolled off or Amy had knocked her off. Amy wasn't, she was shot with the 22, but was not killed. And I believe she started to crawl to try to save her life or whatever. And the guy ended up shooting her with a 380. So she was the only one shot with two, twice, and with two different caliber weapons. Hence, two people being involved. At least two people. But we already discussed that. This Maurice Pierce is picked up. His weapon, a 22 revolver, is confiscated. It doesn't match. The ballistics doesn't match. Some eight years later, the, the case goes cold, essentially. Tons of tips, but it goes cold. Eventually, new case officers take over, and they revisit Maurice Pierce. And they talk to his friends, Mike Scott, Robert Springsteen, and Forrest Wellborn. And eventually... Mike Scott and Robert Springsteen, I believe it was those two, it was definitely Mike Scott confessed to these murders. It was through hours and days of interrogation. He cooperated and he had said that they had, it was Maurice's idea. They were at the mall earlier. They had gone into the yogurt shop. They had cased it out. He had actually asked to use the restroom which, you know, it could have been what the military police officer had seen earlier. It would match, right, because he just ordered a soda. It's like somebody that doesn't want to stand out by not ordering anything, and he's really there just to case the place for a burglary. And then he asked to use the restroom, which is what they said he did. He went and stuck either a folded cigarette pack in the back door to keep it open or a rock he didn't know which and he left they came back all four of them one stayed outside to watch three of them went in the back door and they robbed and killed and raped the girls now the confession obviously goes into a lot more detail and if you want to read that certainly look it up but I'm not going to regurgitate it but there was elements there that it seemed like only the offenders would know there are other things that he certainly they got wrong completely and it kind of reminded me of the west memphis 3 interrogation now <clears throat> you can be up in the air on what you think about the west memphis 3 whether they're guilty or not but there was no evidence much in this case there is no evidence to point these four guys there Yet, based off of the confession, Mike Scott and, and I believe it was Robert Springsteen were arrested. I keep getting Springsteen and Forrest Wellborn confused, but two of the individuals were arrested. They pled not guilty. Now, it's important that the Mike Scott confessed. And then they went and interviewed the other guy, and I believe it was Springsteen, but again, I could be wrong. It could have been... Forrest Wellborn, but they confessed as well. So now you have two people confessing. All four got arrested, two of them confessed, and those two are the ones that ended up going to trial. They were found guilty. One was sentenced to life in jail, and the other one was convicted and sentenced to die. Based off no evidence that I saw, doesn't mean that they didn't do it. But I just didn't see the evidence there. Now, they do some time in jail, and they are let out. They are let out on appeals. Not that they were innocent, um, but they they got out, and that threw the families into a loop. The families really believed that these four individuals committed the crime, and they could be right. The reason 
But there is so much doubt, besides there not being any evidence, is it eventually came out, like I had stated, that two of the girls were sexually assaulted. I kept reading that DNA was found. DNA was found on one of the bodies. Well, what type of DNA? That's what I need to know. Was it blood? Did one of the offenders bleed on her? Was it touch DNA? Obviously, probably not, because you have the fire department in there with a big hose and destroying all the evidence. They didn't know. You know, they're putting out a fire, saving other people, saving other businesses, and, and things like that. But then I, I read and I wrote down the source here somewhere that it came from uh, the Austin, I believe, newspaper. The Austin Chronicle actually stated it was a vaginal swab from Amy. Now remember, Amy is the youngest. She's 13. Okay, does that mean a pedophile? We don't even know if she was raped. Could she have been having consensual sex? I doubt it at that age, and I think victimology would tell you no. The more I dug, though, there was DNA inside of Jennifer, who was 17. And it, it stated that it had matched her boyfriend. And it was confirmed that they started having sex that week and actually had sex that day prior to her going to work. But the DNA from the vaginal swab of Amy was used YSTR testing. Now what YSTR testing, DNA testing is, and listen, I, I'm pretty familiar with DNA because of my years as you know a detective and but I also we ran our own lab at ASOC I created a lab with Susanna Ryan in order to test DNA during the course of that I used Y STR testing a lot it's not as specific as regular DNA is, it can't. I de why is STR cannot say it's you, but what it can say is that it's you or somebody in your parental uh, heritage. So it could be male heritage. It could be your dad. It could be your cousin. It could be your brother. So on and so forth. But that's okay. We'll take that as a detective. You know, that's a lead that you got to follow up on. Now that YSTR DNA did not match any of those four boys that was arrested. Yet the prosecution would not budge. And they said, well, there must have been a fifth person. Uh, I don't like that. You have to admit that you're wrong. If it's proven that Amy was sexually assaulted and you have that killer's DNA and I heard that they said that that YSTR DNA matched what was in another girl another victim there and I'm, it didn't say which one now if that's true You have two sexual assault victims either either raped by the same individual or or is it more likely that it's possibly a brother or a cousin and they're related. The two offenders are related. Very possible. If that is true, that YSTR testing from vaginal swabs from the victims match. It doesn't match any of the four individuals. Okay? If that's the case, please, you 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 have to admit that you're wrong. You know that that confession that they gave was fed. And I don't want to get into fed confessions. I did that in the West Memphis 3 case, essentially telling them what to say. 
An example in this case, they said, what did you tie her up with? What did you tie her up with? And he's like, Venetian blinds. Well, you know that you didn't tie her up with Venetian blinds. Well, napkins. You know you didn't tie her up with napkins. You used a bra, didn't you? Stuff like that. Yeah, then I, I did. And then it matches the crime scene. Hey, there's police that might not like to hear that. I'm sorry, that's the truth. Um, sometimes the interrogation tactics backfire. In this case, I look at evidence. If at least two of these girls were sexually assaulted, and that DNA proves it from a vaginal swab that was not destroyed by fire, you got to understand, semen inside somebody, uh, more than likely, obviously, is protected from this fire and from the elements enough that they're able to get YSTR DNA. It's not these four people, okay? Like I said in my criminal profile, I believe it was two people. And more than likely, it's the two people that were sitting up front in that booth and they are waiting for it to close. That's my opinion on it. Notes. Let's get through this. In that confession, and this is very important, I watched the confession of the guy, Mike Scott, and his written confession said he heard a whoosh sound when he lit the fire, and he, he used the, the term accelerant. An accelerant is a cop's term. That's an investigator's term. It's not this guy's term. So again, to me, it's write what I'm telling you to write. I have here a 22 was not the murder weapon. Well, obviously a 22 was a murder weapon. It just wasn't Maurice Pierce's that he had on him. Two people. They didn't bring bindings. Leg spread? Question mark. I read that they were posed with their legs spread, and I and I don't. I don't understand that because I only saw it in one report and I don't know how that could be with the fire and them stacked on top of each other but I, I guess it it's possible um, if that's the case I think the sexual component of this gets turned up a notch right now you know, I still believe that it was a robbery and then the rape was secondary after they stripped them. It was more like, okay, this is here, we're gonna we're gonna take it, basically. However, if they were posed, if their legs were spread purposefully, that may change things a little bit, but I can't comment on it because I only saw it in one report. I have here that they were experienced. They tied up with the victim's bindings, and I think they've done that before. He strips them to control them. Um, again, it could be that he strips them to control them, yes, but it, it could also be that it was a sexually motivated crime if their legs were spread and it pointed me towards that direction. But I just, it hasn't pointed me to there yet. It's just still a robbery to me. I have here, is there, it's not juveniles. If it is juveniles, it's juveniles that spent time in either a juvenile facility or a correctional institute. Um, they felt comfortable there. And that's important. They spent an hour there. Okay? A robbery takes less than five minutes. Okay, they spent some time there, and they they felt comfortable there. I have here. I believe they were arrested before and did prison time. If you know that you're going to kill them, why bind them and strip them? Now think about that. Think about it. If you know going into the robbery, I'm gonna we're gonna kill them. 
then why bind them? There's no reason to, right? Because you're going to kill them. But it's done. So you have to determine why. What is the reason to do that? And the only reason that I could come up with initially is control. It's to control them. Um, again, possible sexual component to it. And that's why I feel that it's a, an experienced, hardcore criminal. Criminals. You kill them because they either knew, they, the victims knew them, or they had been caught before through an eyewitness. And I had gone through that. And, and I, that's what I believe. They're just not taking the chance. Hey, I've done prison time before based off an eyewitness that I left alive. And now I'm not taking that chance. I'm shooting them and I'm going to burn all the evidence. I have written down here in 1990, so one year previous to this homicide in Austin, Texas, there were only 46 homicides. The population there is half a million people. That's not a lot, folks. That's not a lot of homicides for that population. So think about that. Again, it's a planned robbery. Now, I saw a photo of a money bag somewhere uh, underneath the register or something that had money in it, yet like $540 was taken, but this money bag was not taken. So what, what's the reasoning of that? Do we, do we know? And I don't think we do know. Could it have just been missed? Very possible. That's very possible in this case. Another aspect that I, I want to bring up is something small, but sometimes it's the small stuff that sticks out or can solve a case. You know, as a detective, that's all you ever want is to have another lead. You know, I would be at my desk working on a cold case, and you had knocked on all the doors that you could knock on. And you're kind of waiting for a tip to come in because you, you, you want something to follow up on. And... One of the things that stuck out to me, and I don't know if anybody ever picked up on it, but think about this. The guy had a lighter, right? That's something small, but it's overlooked. So how can you introduce that into your criminal profile? Well, you could say that the guy either is a smoker or it leads to it being planned. Now, if there was an accelerant used, it certainly leads to it being planned. Um, no, does that help? Yeah, but let's say that no accelerant was used, but the guy definitely had a lighter on him. Now, you could have a lighter on you and it still be planned, for sure. But you also have to consideration that maybe he was a smoker. Now, I had read that the original investigator had specifically said something about crack cocaine, about these robberies were a part of maybe somebody on crack cocaine. I don't see that. I mean, it could be, but there's nothing at that crime scene that tells me these people were intoxicated on drugs or anything like that. Now, could the robbery robbery have taken place because somebody wanted to get money for the weekend party? Yes, absolutely. No doubt about that. If I was an investigator on this, I would be looking for, like I had said, experienced, hardcore criminal types, probably in their 20s, had done some time in prison, more than likely, and was fingered in a burglary or robbery or sexual assault before by an eyewitness, possibly a victim themselves, you know, could have 
had raped somebody in the past and the person identified them as the person that committed the rape may have been a smoker certainly probably did time in a state prison or a correctional facility um had probably done burglaries in that area before maybe not that immediate vicinity um, but it wasn't their first time to know to do this at that specific time that to me that's somebody with experience they know that the front door is locked they can take them to the back and take their time and, and bind and gag them and do what they want I have a tough time with this with this case those four girls were just working and two of them in the wrong place at the wrong time and this happened to them what else would I be looking for though uh, as as a detective certainly be looking and I'm sure they are to identify those two individuals that were seen in that shop at 1042 listen if those chairs are turned upside down so they can mop the floors in all of the booths and all of the tables except for the one that the couple saw those two individuals sitting at that's that's telling in the front door being locked um, those are the two I, I feel confident in saying that unless the police know something that I do not know that's where you're looking at and if that YSTR DNA is found in two different girls and they, that matches the YSTR matches you're probably looking at a relative not of the victims the two offenders being relatives unless the one offender raped both of them for that to occur I would want to know hey what's the amount of DNA found okay because an individual an offender is not going to rape and ejaculate into one girl and then within 30 minutes do it to another girl and ejaculate again I, it's possible certainly is possible I find that hard to believe but I mean it does happen but knowing that two individuals were involved I would expect maybe two of them to be involved in the rapes but maybe not uh, it, it certainly could be two offenders one rape both of them how do we know they didn't rape all four of them you know I, I don't know that there's a lot to this that I probably don't know. I'm sure I don't know that is still being it looks like li little by little things are being let out through the years and that's usually how it works in cold cases so it's possible all four were raped but right now what we know is two of them were and that this is coming from the defense attorney of one of the individuals that I read was quoted as saying that the YSTR from Amy matched YSTR in another victim. And remember, YSTR is only male DNA. Because when you get DNA, you always get two DNAs. Let's say there's a rape victim. One's always going to be the female and the male. Now how you can, be, you know, because they're mixed together and you have to separate them and one of the ways to do that is through YSTR DNA it just takes the male DNA out of the mixture hopefully that makes sense DNA is tough to uh, wrap your head around sometimes and I don't think I have uh, I don't have enough lately enough uh, training you know it's been a few years 
since I've really uh, brushed up on my DNA knowledge. So there's probably n newer techniques out there, but I, I am familiar with YSTR DNA. That's going to be it for these yogurt shop murders. That's my assessment. That's what I think. Two individuals that were there, I don't think, you know, from what I see, there's certainly no evidence that those four individuals did it. I don't think that their confession really matched up to anything that I saw. But again, I don't, I didn't, haven't seen everything and I don't know everything. I gave the criminal profile, the crime scene assessment of what it told me, and I will leave everybody with that. So with that said, tough case. We're going to be doing a, uh, a live chat about this tomorrow, Thursday at 7 o'clock as usual, and then Friday I'll be answering your questions and comments about this case. This is a case that I'm not very familiar with going into it, but I became really attached to it for some reason the more I got into it and I don't know why that is I mean I've done hundreds of cases where kids were involved and stuff and these were teenagers but uh, maybe it was because it seemed like there was a lot there criminal profile wise and crime scene assessment wise that I felt very confident about giving my opinion and maybe that's why it grabbed the hold of me a little bit and told me, you know, just what I reported. Somebody very comfortable in that environment. And usually when you're comfortable in certain environments because you're experienced. Think about anything you do in life. Um, let's say it's driving. You know, when you first start driving, you're not very confident, you know. You're edgy. You're just not experienced with it. But think about now, when you get in a car, you don't even think about things. Automatic, you put on your seatbelt, turn the radio on, whatever it is you do, and you go. It's experience. You're comfortable. I felt that they were comfortable there because they're experienced criminals. In their 20s, you can be an experienced criminal. Prison, oftentimes, is a learning ground where you hone your criminal skills. Juvenile facilities, the same thing. It doesn't take, take place from experience. Now, it's possible that one of these two offenders was more experienced than the other. Doesn't mean both of them were in prison together or even in prison. One of them was. One of them was very experienced and probably a ringleader, more the alpha dog telling the other one what to do, more than likely. Um, but one of them was experienced and one of them more than likely did some sort of time and was experienced in doing this and very importantly had some sort of familiarity with arson at least to the point where hey cover our tracks and we do that by burning the place don't think it's anything a juvenile would do again unless unless that juveniles was experienced in doing this but I find that hard to believe. All right, that's it for Maine's, Maine's uh, little assessment today. I hope you learned something as always. Horrible. Again, I want to send my condolences to the family. Uh, it's something they'll never, they'll never get over. Whether they believe these four individuals committed the crimes or not, it's still a horrible, horrible, horrible tragedy. One parent lost two of their daughters. They will never be the same again. And I know that through experience. So my condolences to them. And everybody else that was affected by this horrible tragedy. So I will see you Thursday on the live session. Friday, I will answer your questions and comments. Until next week where we start a whole new case over again. All right. With that said... Mains out. All right, so now we're at uh, the question and answer period, which is Friday for the yogurt shop murder. So uh, let's get started. I believe they were killed due to knowing their killers also body stacked to burn. Yeah, Art Gross, that's a very good uh, possibility. 
Um, I, I certainly subscribe to the theory of the bodies being stacked easily to burn them. Huh, what is the song in the beginning of all these videos? It is Fear and Love by Dallas Kincaid, I believe. Sarah Tannis says body stacking. Drivers from mortuaries will do this when multiple deceased people need to be picked up and taken to the morgue around the same time. It's called stacking. Okay, I got gotcha. you. I believe that. Again, Melody Campbell. It's possible the girls knew the perpetrators. It's possible. But is it probable? Cynthia Gibson says rob robbery was secondary. Well, Cynthia, I don't think that you can make that assumption. Um, why? You have to, you know, when you give um, something like that, a um, your theory, explain it. Why? <sighs> Colt Heron, you are not going to be smoking crack with any type of refillable lighter. The logistics of the freebase process just does not lend itself to a refillable lighter, whether it's a Zippo or a torch. Well, there's, cool, I understand what you're saying, but freebasing and crack uh, are two different things. Freebasing crack and regular smoking of crack, it wouldn't matter how you would light it, but I, I understand what you're trying to say there. Um, but, but it's still possible. I mean, they could have lighter fluid for uh, a Zippo, or we don't even know if lighter fluid was used. That's the whole thing here. So I'm not sure that we can go that route. Uh, Ruthie, out of work and ready for my mains squeeze. Oh, thank you, Ruth. Okay, Phoebe Armstrong. It's not about the skill as a detective. It's about fresh eyes looking at it from a different perspective. It's not about ability. It's about the victim. Ego has no precedence in murder cases. The reason you're at that site is because of the victims. Please remember that. This is the reason I watch you. You care about the case. The reason you're there. Thank you. I just I don't understand that. I'm sorry. I don't get that one. MD. I was 21 when this happened, and I lived in Austin. Couldn't believe it. Then my good friend moved to Pompano Beach, Florida, in 1993, and was murdered a year later. Her case is still unsolved. I'm sorry about that, MD. Wesley Lee, I usually try to become the perp, so if I sit and wait, I have a reason, and the brutality, I'm angry, and the degradation, I felt degraded or envious, just seems personal and filled with hate, it's possible, stink feet, Ken, thanks for doing this video. I know a lot of other people had requested it as well as myself. Great evaluation. I agree with your assessment of this case. The convoluted false confessions and misdirection they caused must have thrown the APD into a tailspin. They never took their eyes off the four boys long enough to pursue the two persons of interest that I'm convinced perpetrated this horrific crime and are running free today. Well, to me, I mean, I understand how they came up with the four suspects. I have no problem with that. But then, once DNA gets involved, then it's from vaginal smears from a rape, not touch DNA that could be transferred. Okay, now I got a problem. And now you're going to have to start looking at that YSTR DNA in two different victims that match each other. Simple as that. I mean... When you're wrong, you have to admit you're wrong. That's all there is. <sighs> Steve Shanos. I would love to see you look into the Sherman murders in Toronto, Canada. I've never heard of those. Michael Kerrigan. Hi, Ken. You have reckoned 
that the perpetrators were comfortable. What is the chances the girls were also? Well, that's, you know, that's a thing that I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> I find it hard to believe if they, I mean, I'm sure they were comfortable locking up the place and maybe having two people in there past the time that they're locking up. You know, they start locking up at, what, 10-something, start cleaning up, lock the door so no other customers can come in, but if there's customers already in there sitting, they're not going to kick them out until 11 o'clock. Um, so they were probably comfortable. That's the problem is nobody knows. Um, I guarantee they weren't comfortable when they started getting herded into the back. And I hope I come across this one comment that I read that something about it occurring up front. Why didn't it stop there and continue into the back or something? And I saw no evidence that anything happened up front. Hope I run into that comment and I'll, I'll definitely read it. Brett H. I believe them being stripped naked shows the motive was a sexual motive. For again, how many non-sexual cases involve people stripping down naked? Well, quite a few actually, Brett. Um, it could have been sexually motivated, but I don't think you can say that for sure. Uh, especially if it was secondary, if robbery was first. Now, I mean, there's some some contention as whether money was ta taken. It, it, there was money taken, but there was some money that was not taken. So therefore, people want to say, well, it was a sexually motivated crime then and not burglary because they didn't take that. Listen, they just, they, they didn't see it or they got locked lost in all the confusion and all the chaos that was going on they still took money so whether robbery was the primary motive which I believe it was um, and the assault being secondary or vice versa I mean I could be a fool and sit here and tell you for sure that's this is what it is but you know I don't do that unless there's facts to back it up Why is the different? Why is this different than Scott's confessed version, where they came in the back door that they propped open? Michelle, well, Michelle, it's a lot different because the they didn't come in the back door. What I'm saying is, it was the two people that were sitting at the at the booth it had nothing to do with the people that confessed. Judy Holiday, I thought this case had been solved. What a huge disappointment to find out that the monsters that did this still walking amongst us. I agree. Oh. Great channel. I thoroughly enjoy hearing your assessments. If the fire was contained to the back room, was there a chance DNA could have been left in the booth the two guys were in? Not sure how much water... The fire department used in the front N no the whole place was saturated rated with water front and back um, back when this happened you were not going to be pulling touch DNA and if you did it would have just been a huge convoluted mess because you would have had hundreds of people that sat at that booth so you would have had a mixture so uh, no chance for DNA Alyssa Wright, one thing comes to mind when you say comfortable there. They may have worked in the shop at one point in time. Most places shut down and new businesses move in. I agree on one being experienced criminal and setting the fire it destroyed valuable evidence. Possible. Raven 696, if it was intended to be a sexual assault in the first place, was the DNA recovered from the two girls who were the frontline workers, the ones the criminals have seen? No. No, they weren't. It was from Amy, who was a helper, and I think one of the workers, and I believe it was Sarah. Epic. I feel like the main motive was the assault. To your point, I feel like they planned on binding them with their undergarments. I think that's probably part of their kink. I agree they're probably ex-cons. That area during that time was a hotbed for murders. 
Yeah, and I tell you, I got a uh, I got a message from uh, Jason Jensen, who is a private investigator, uh, and he had watched my assessment, and he did a little digging, and he sent me a news article of two brothers uh, in their early twenties. One was a little bit older than the other one that had a previous conviction for a robbery and had done time and had gone out and had moved to Austin, Texas, where this occurred. So it's things like that, you know, that need to be followed up on. And that's ex exactly, you know, what I thought that it could be two brothers, two cousins or something like that. Somebody related had done previous uh, jail stint, prison stint. So, you know, hey, thanks for uh, looking at that for sure. Later days, listening to you work through and break this stuff down is fascinating. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I do my best. And I'm not saying I'm 100% on anything because I don't feel that I am, but I do what I can. Supreme M. So does one DNA result match a boyfriend or not? No, I don't believe it matched the boyfriend. Would these girls allow strangers to sit in the cafe past closing hours? Yes, I don't think they had closed yet. I think they were still getting ready to close, maybe turned the sign over that it was closed. They couldn't close until 11. So I'm sure right when 11 occurred, they were getting ready or was trying to usher them out. I mean, people saw them in there. So, I mean, it happened. Unless the girls knew the perpetrators, I am inclined to think they returned to the premises when the girls thought it was secure too much time passed between closing and reported fire. No, I don't think so. I don't think the, they ever left. They were doing nefarious acts um, when that shop closed until you know they left and started that fire Sherry Blankenbacker Detective Maines your thoughts is it possible for some residual from the first rape to be transferred to the second rape therefore leaving DNA from the same perpetrator yes that is possible and I wondered that myself you know, you, you always want to know, well, what's the quantity of semen that's in each victim or in a victim? So, yes, it's very possible that it's the same YSTR as just one person. So two YSTRs and two different rape victims, but it's from one offender from there to there. Very possible. Still, I still don't think that that changes the assessment that it was at least two people, obviously, because... Of the weapons used now again you could say well one offender could have two different weapons they could but I doubt it one person could control four girls okay get a lot of talk about that people say well how can one person control four people I always go back to the BTK killer and Dennis Rader and listen to how he killed the Otero family which was at least four of them and he was by himself, and he controlled him with a gun, and he raped some, he hung some, he smothered some. I mean, so it, it certainly can be done. But in this case, I want to say that it's more than likely two offenders. Janny B. It's unusual to burn a place down after a robbery. Any other crime like this statewide or nation? Um, that's not unusual at all, at all, especially for experienced criminals to cover their tracks. They'll burn down uh, places. It happens all the time. I agree that the reason they were tied up was to control them, so it was two. Those two still present at last sale, at least inside. Maybe lookouts also because they were so confident staying there. It's possible they had a lookout. 
See Amy Geller case for why people might be stacked with items on them. This is a known tactic of military and some home invasion robberies. Well, it's not too hard to, uh, to figure out. I mean, if you're going to stack the bodies, you do that and put stuff on them so they burn quicker. Especially um, plastic cups and stuff like that. Like I said, I believe that this guy probably did an arson fire before and was familiar with that. Steve Miller, you look like Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump in your undercover pick. <laughs> I've heard that before. Thank you. Or maybe not thank you. Well, at least you didn't say I looked like Forrest Gump. And then I would take that differently. But I've heard Lieutenant Dan before because I think he played in the Terminator. As, I don't know, obviously not Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> but he played in that and people tell me that I look like him too. So, okay, I digress again. Cynthia Key, you convinced me once again. And, hey, that's good, but remember, my goal is not to convince anybody. It's just to give my opinion, and I won't debate anybody, because I don't debate. I give my opinions, and I listen to other people's opinions, um, but I'm not trying to convince anybody, so that's important. Okay, hi Ken, great breakdown. Surely they would not have cashed up before these two individuals left. Do you think the girls asked them to finish up and leave before crime took place multiple times? Uh, I think that, I mean, the, the receipt shows that they, they cashed out at a certain time after 11 o'clock. Um, and I don't think that they, I think they would do it with those people there, you know, I, I don't see an issue with that. My best friend was one of the 46 homicides in Austin in 1990. I didn't know the number was that low. She was also a teen murdered by a stranger like this case. I'm curious to know what other homicide situations were as a drug related or domestic robber or stranger. I'm sorry with the loss of your friend. <sighs> Helen Wright. My stab at why tie them up and then kill them. I wonder if the bondings was because they were initially robbing them. After the sexual assault, they were facing a new harsher set of charges, so they switched from wanting to control to wanting to eliminate the witnesses. All speculation, but it potentially fits. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of does fit, Helen, so I, I'll give you that one. Boston and a tot. Regardless of how responsible these girls were, minors should have never been left to close a business. The owners put these children in a dangerous situation. And I read another comment where somebody, and I don't know where this comes from, and I hope there's something to back it up because you never want to accuse anybody again, that the owner has some sort of insurance policy on a fire and a death within there of some sort that he staged this. I see no evidence of that. I'm not going to say that it couldn't happen, um, but you better have some evidence to back that up before you start accusing people like that. That's horrible, horrible accusations for somebody to carry around. So I hope whoever made that statement could back that up with something other than, well, it's just a thought because they had insurance. So what? Everybody has insurance on their home. Just because they have a fire and somebody dies in there doesn't mean that they started it or intended it. So always keep that in mind. All right, D. Wood, if it was a planned robbery, then why not have masks on and ambush them at 1055, take the money and run? Why sit there for an hour if it was the two guys in a booth? This leads me to believe the motive always was more than robbery, especially if they left back door open to gain access. They didn't seem to be experienced robbers. Uh, D., I disagree with you. Um... I didn't, I didn't see anywhere where they left the back door to gain access. I think they, they left out the back door, obviously, because the front door was locked. Um, 
it makes more sense to me that they're sitting in there. Um, if you're, you know, different ways that you can approach that for sure. I understand your first part there about why not ambush them at 1055, but if they're making the cash drop down in the underground safe or whatever it was there, you're not going to get any money when they come out. Um, so why, I mean, they're sitting in there at 1045 or whatever time it was. I don't find that that's odd at all. Um, they're waiting until everybody leaves. Nobody's in there. They're cleaning up and then they make the move. Planned. I, I don't understand what you don't believe in that. But you don't have to believe it. That's the thing. Susan Flavin, is it possible pizza worker discussed with one of the victims about helping at the yoga shop to help close and eventually went there and see her and her friends and things got out of hand? No plan, but maybe with a buddy. I don't think so because I think this was planned, but, you know, anything's possible. Keisha, great breakdown. It seems to me that the men who were sat at the table near closing time should have come forward if they weren't involved unless they had warrants or other law issues. As for the arson, most crimes aren't firebugs. And someone else mentioned that the rapes may have been a pedo, but may be closer in age to the victims. Yeah, you're somewhat right, I think, on there. I don't know about the arson. Most crimes aren't firebugs, or most criminals aren't firebugs. Uh, you're probably right about that, but any hardened criminal knows that a fire destroys evidence. See, there's different reasons for arson. There's some people that get a sexual satisfaction out of arson, and they'll light the fire, and they'll sit there, and they'll, they'll watch it from a distance or whatever. They get off on that. I, that's not what I think about this. This is somebody who's destroying evidence and who has been in trouble before probably was fingered by some witness before and did prison time before and they were not going to have that happen again. He light it on fire. Why did the two boys sit so close to the counter? So actually, whoever came after them remembers them. If they had sat back somewhere, the other customers might not have noticed them. Maybe the girls knew the two boys. Again, it's possible that they knew them. I don't think so, though. Uh, maybe they sat there because, you know, that was the best vantage point for that door. Or maybe you could see the cash register or where they put the money better from that booth than sitting in the back. A lot of different variables as to why they sat there. Christy Nix. For what it's worth, my co-worker described what her husband told her and that everything jives with the police narrative you mentioned, I don't assume. My co-worker claimed firefighters found some of the victims were strung up and hanging from the ceiling. I don't know. Police released few details back then. Perhaps it might be worth interviewing the firefighters who are on scene. I don't think that any of that's true. Um, any of the research that I did, I am sure that, that would have came out. Actually, the firefighters said that they were stepping on them when they were putting out the fire and didn't know it. Um, I, so I highly believe see, that, that that's true at all. Never take a day off. I'm supposed to be working right now, but this guy's awesome. Hey, thanks. I appreciate that. Chance the canine. Ken, you may not be the best, but there's no one better. Hey, see, I was feeling down for a second, and then you brought me back up. Thank you. So if the evidence points to the perpetrators casing the business or the employees prior to the crime, yet there was a large sum source of cash left behind. To me, this points to the physical interaction with the young women being the primary motivation and the intended crime and the theft being incidental. Of 
course, that does not explain the lack of preparation for this type of crime. Again, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you because just because some cash is left behind, it doesn't mean that it wasn't a robbery. Cash was taken. That cash could have been missed. Um, it, it could have been in the chaos of the killings and everything, just missed, forgot about. A sexual assault being secondary in nature. Now, could the assault been primary? Yes, it it certainly could. Um, let me think about this for a second because I was trying to think. Well, wouldn't wouldn't a better location? Couldn't you choose a better location if the sexual assault was what was primary? And I don't think you could. I think that that shop in the back there at closing time is a perfect is perfect for a sexual assault to take place. Um, but for four of them, that the number bothers me that there was four of them if that was the planned event. So I'm going to still say yes. You're right. It's possible. But for me. I don't believe it's probable. I still think robbery was the primary motive. But you got me thinking, and that was Ren. So, thank you. Outlandish history. If an accelerant was used, do you think the suspect could have been a Zippo user? That could explain easy access to lighter fluid. Yeah, but we don't know lighter fluid was used. That's never been proven. So, I don't know. I don't even consider lighter fluid. Until somebody could definitely say, hey, we found a lighter fluid bottle nearby, or, you know, the arson investigator says, yes, it is. This has not been proven, so. Rob Garrison. So basically, the perps are at least early 20s because of the witnesses that saw them. Overhead picture of scene and other pictures verify statement of the booth in the back is where the two were at. I think it was up front totally believe your assessment so the next move for anyone that wants to dig deeper is to locate any past convicted thefts or rapists who fit the age window yep and Jason did that so you're thinking ahead and he already did that okay Were these two from out of town? I keep getting this question in my head. Major highways right there, trains, no one recognizes these guys. Yeah, it's very possible, Gina. I think it's possible. Okay. I don't understand the choice of target. If Austin was a place where crime happened less, especially serious crime, which likely means less need for security measures, why choose the yogurt sharp as your target? A place where there aren't expensive items and during winter. A time that logic would tell you that the business would be less and a Friday night. I would chalk that up to the other businesses being closed at that time. And that's why that was chosen. And also maybe because they were teenage girls, which are not in truth always, but in stereotype at least weak and easier to control. It'd be my guess on that. I also think that the two boys who sat in the front could have been the killers since only that table wasn't cleaned by the girls. But then the boy who took water and asked to go to the girls' bathroom could have been one or two or the third. You're you're right. All you said there, B. M. Medina is correct. Okay, Katie Hess, Detective Maines. I read from one of the Austin papers that an ice cream scooper was placed between the legs of Sarah. How does that play into your assessment as far as sexual? Um, I don't. I didn't. I didn't factor it in because there was no evidence of that being used. If it would have been in, inserted, then certainly. But all the chaos, all the rushing around, everything that happened in there, the fire hydrants, throwing those hoses, throwing all that water around, it could have easily just landed there. 
Uh, so I didn't play that in at all because especially knowing that they were raped. So it, I didn't even consider it. I also found that one of the girls, I think Eliza, was found with her hands behind her back but no bindings. I read that too and I, I guess I'm just a little confused on that. Um, I don't know. I can't really make an assessment on, on that when I don't know why that is or the, or the validity of it. I also read that a couple years later they had an arson investigator look everything over and he determined that gasoline had been used. I know the one girl's face was so charred that she had to be ID'd by dental records. Maybe he stacked them in essence to build a bonfire. I ask this respectfully. But one would think the firemen would have easily smelled that. That's the thing, okay? Now you have lighter fluid, someone else says gas. So when you have all those contradicting things for me, I just disregard them. You, if you can't figure it out, I don't care then whether it's gas, I don't care whether it's lighter fluid because you don't know 100%, so you can't build your assessment off of that. Maybe check out Jennifer's admirers or previous boyfriends. Could have been enraged that he wasn't her first. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not buying that. Because then, well, I mean, that's no, not buying it. Also saw somewhere that one of the dads had dropped the two girls off to help because they wanted to get off work sooner. Yeah, I think I read that too. Kind of the same thing of those two people um, coming from the mall. Maybe the dad dropped them off at the mall. They walked up. But yeah, the whole premise was them to help them get off work sooner. I had read that one guy was there first and then the other joined them. Joined him. This could have been why he was ushering others forward in the line. He was waiting for the other guy. This is a patron behavior. Then he asked the guy if he was a cop. No criminals who were as cautious as these guys is going to ask a guy if he's a cop. So the question is, why did he take the risk to draw the attention to himself by asking that question? If you believe he is one of the perps, and I believe he was, this tells me that they were not a plan to rob initially second reason is for this belief is who is going to hang there well over an hour beforehand these same guys who assassinated these girls that just doesn't add up well I think I would have to I mean I understand where you're coming from um, and I that question about whether he's a cop does bother me I mean, that's almost, but I didn't think that that was the guy that sat at the booth. My assumption was that's the guy that went into the bathroom, asked to use the bathroom. I thought we were, that's two separate individuals that we're talking about. Um, but I understand what you're saying about that. Why draw attention to yourself, you know, by asking this guy if he's a cop, if you were planning on doing a robbery. So, yep, I agree with that. I I understand what you're getting at. All right, let me find one more. There's that main smile and twinkle that says, I don't like that. Agreed. For a prosecutor to have to throw in another offender because he can't admit he's wrong is wrong and tarnishes his integrity. Agreed. Justice isn't just about getting a conviction. It's about sentencing the guilty and being 100% sure about it because of irrefutable evidence. Nothing like the element of surprise. Two girls, now we have visitors. That gave them the oh crap moment that changed things. I feel bad for the families. Thank you, Detective, for taking out the big shovel in this deep dive. Donna, I can't agree anymore. I mean, that's a perfect one to end with, and I agree with you 100%. Um, you can't hide behind um, a badge or a title to mask your lack of integrity okay and you your integrity is up front and it's doing 
what's right when nobody's looking. And you have to have that, especially in this field. So I think you just have to say you're wrong and move on. And I don't think it was those four guys that they arrested. And I think DNA tells you that. But then again, listen, I don't have the case file in front of me. I'm going off of what everybody else has. What everybody else sees is the same thing that I see. Maybe they know more, and they usually do. Um, so I can preface that by saying, from what I see from the outside, they have the wrong people tunnel vision on. So I'd like to know, uh, like to know more about those two brothers, you know, that I had talked about earlier. But just because they kind of fit the profile, you can't start narrowing, you know, on them and trying to make everything fit them either. Uh, it was they were just two people, but that's how an investigation begins. If something doesn't add up on them, you move on. If things keep building, then that's how you build a case. So that's it for the yogurt shop murder. So uh, I think tomorrow will be Saturday, and I got a bonus video that I'm gonna put out another elite members request. I'm in hammering those out because hey you guys deserve that um and it will be mara murray i believe so i took a look at that not sure of the case that i'm going to do next week yet um just not sure i might even take a week off uh, <laughs> hate to do that to you guys but i give you a chance also to go back through the uh the past videos that you haven't seen and maybe watch or do some more research and uh you know we'll see what happens You'll know when I know, I'll put it out to you. So thanks again, another great week, another great amount of questions. Um, I respect your questions and hopefully you respect my uh, assessments and we'll keep doing them. Okay, until next time, happy Thanksgiving for everybody. Um, and you know what's next. Man. <laughs>